Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. <laughs> when a storm of TIE interceptors came out of nowhere and began attack runs on Christ Castle, bo had this one line. That's a lot of ships for an Imperial warlord. It is indeed. The largest ship that Moff Gideon could muster up was a puny light Imperial cruiser. He didn't even have a Star Destroyer at his disposal. To be a true Imperial Warlord, you kind of need at least one Star Destroyer, maybe a necklace made out of alien skulls and a Wookiee rug. The attack on Kry's castle wasn't just made by a bunch of random ships. This was a highly coordinated assault featuring TIE interceptors, not the standard TIE fighter, and a group of TIE bombers, which would end up destroying bo home. These are the same type of bombers, by the way, who ended the Mandalorian civilization during the Great Purge. I'm sure seeing those ships drop proton bombs on her home stirred up some terrible memories for bo -Katan. So who's responsible for this attack on bo castle, and what's the point? The poor woman's lost everything. Her sword, her family, her army, her fleet, her dignity and purpose. Why strike her when she's already down for the count? It's almost as if someone has some beef with this Mandalorian princess. Maybe it's someone higher up, some individual that Moff Gideon used to report to, potentially? I mean, from what we know about Star Wars history, a few years earlier, after the Battle of Jakku, a chunk of the Imperial Remnant forces would escape into the Unknown Region. This breakaway faction was a part of Emperor Palpatine and Gallus Rax's contingency plan, and they would one day turn into the First Order. Everyone else who was left behind, like Moff Gideon, I guess were considered scrubs by Palpatine, or he just didn't have a plan for them. And so who could be Moff Gideon's boss and at the same time have some beef with Bo-Katan? Well, everyone's favorite Blue Grand Admiral, Mithra Nuedo, or Thrawn for short. But before we get to that, a quick word from today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. It's their fourth anniversary. That's four years of bringing us some of the finest free RPG action on mobile devices. And man, has this game changed a lot since those early days. Now there are over 650 unique champions to collect from and battle with that are Death Knights. Like Ethel, for instance, everyone's favorite starting champion and paladin. We've been through so much over the years, it's kind of nice knowing she'll be there for me in my pocket and my phone whenever I need to crush some demon skulls. Anyway, to celebrate their fourth anniversary, Raid Shadow Legends is rolling out tons of free stuff, free events, even an anniversary-themed legendary champion. So scan that QR code on screen or check out the description down below and get the epic champion Kellen the Shrike and a bag full of awesome goodies from energy refills to XP brews for free. And for both new and existing players, use the promo code Four Years Raid, all caps, to get your hands on four legendary skill tomes and even more free stuff. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. You see, years ago during the Lothal campaign, the Grand Admiral was on the verge of destroying both the locally based Phoenix Cell and also the Masasi group. These were two of the largest rebel cells in the galaxy, and the destruction of these ships and people would have been a huge setback for the rebellion. It is very possible that had Grand Admiral Thrawn won the Lothal campaign, that the rebels would not have been prepared for the Death Star program. We all know how tight the margins were in that story. If they had been just one monk shy, one droid short, one hammerhead corvette misplaced, and one less magical farm boy and his equally magical Karelian pal, then the whole thing could have collapsed. The Empire could have won and brought peace and stability to the galaxy. Maybe. Probably not. So at this battle, Thrawn had tracked down the Lothal rebels to a planet known as Athlon. The rebel Masasi group was visiting and inspecting the base. Thrawn sprung his trap and sent his seventh fleet to blockade the entire system. Along with him, he brought two interdictors. These were capital ships that were equipped with massive gravity well projectors, which basically disabled ships hyperdrives. This meant that the rebels would be unable to escape the system into hyperspace. And so Thrawn could use his numerical and firepower superiority to destroy the rebels one by one in subspace. Except that's not what happened. First, one of his admirals, Constantine, made a foolish mistake and exposed one of the interdictors to the enemy formation, allowing rebel commander Jun Sato to ram it and destroy it. The Jedi Ezra Bridger was able to use his momentary gap in the gravity wells to escape and call for reinforcements. And who does he bring back? Well, it's Clan Wren, whose matriarch served beneath bo -Katan in the Night Owls. In the 11th hour, with the Rebel fleets in grave danger, Mandalorian Super Commandos arrive in the rear of Thrawn's formation and perform a dangerous EVA assault on the last remaining interdictor, and they manage to destroy it. 
giving the rebel fleet a clear passage to freedom. I mean, months later, Thrawn would be defeated by those same rebels and a bunch of space whales because of his failure at Tatooine. Now, Thrawn will eventually return, even though he got spirited away in a very terrifying manner, it is very clear that he is slated for a return. In the Rebels' final episode, there's a Lord of the Rings-style recap where we skip forward like five years and find out what everyone is doing. Sabian Wren has chosen to stay on Lothal, and out of the blue, Ahsoka Tano arrives and invites her on a journey to find Ezra, who has also been spirited away by those same whales. The idea has always been that if they find Ezra, then they'll also find Thrawn. And so since then, Thrawn's kind of just been chilling in the peripherals, but there have actually been a lot of small little clues here and there that Thrawn is going to come, and he's going to come soon. And I think us fans were hanging on to every little detail. Like when we run into Ahsoka Tano in The Mandalorian in the second season, which happened just a few years after Ahsoka returns to Lothal looking for Sabine. We don't see Sabine run with Ahsoka, so it's possible that their mission was successful and they did find Ezra. And either the mission was complete or, I don't know, I kind of, uh, you know, shipped these two a little bit. Pretty sure the Jedi and the Mandalorians are both heading towards a demographic crisis after some poorly made leadership decisions by both groups, and they really need to now re-up on some babies. I mean, you can only kidnap so many orphan children on battlefields of your making before or people figure out what you're doing is kind of messed up. Anyway, no matter what happens to Sabine and Ezra, Ahsoka is still on the hunt for Thrawn a few years later when she appears in The Mandalorian on the planet of Corvus. She had tracked down a former apprentice of Thrawn, Magistrate Morgan Elsbeth. Elsbeth had taken over the city of Kaladin and had fortified it against all outsiders, making it very difficult for Ahsoka to reach her and question her in a friendly manner. But with Din's help, she eventually confronts the Magistrate and they have a good old-fashioned sparring sesh. It should have been a very easy fight for Ahsoka, who's probably at this time one of the top 10 deadliest duelists in the galaxy. But the Magistrate does manage to hold her own for a pretty respectable amount of time. She's wielding a Viscar Spear and the martial arts training that Thrawn most likely passed on to her. Thrawn wasn't just a tactical and strategic genius and a lover of art. He also believed that shaping the body to perfection and learning how to use your body as a weapon was just as important as taking care of one's mind. Now tell me. Where is your master? Where is Grand Admiral Thrawn? Now, Ahsoka tries her best to get the Magistrate talking, but the Magistrate is loyal and that is expected out of Thrawn's servants and underlings. He actually invests a lot of time in developing the people underneath his command, as any good leader should. It's also why he runs a very tight ship and he only surrounds himself with very capable individuals, or at least individuals willing to learn. Now, two things to notice here. One is that this woman is still clearly loyal to Thrawn, and number two, Thrawn wants his location to be hidden. It also should be noted that the Magistrate is not in command of Imperial troops or droids. Instead, she has a rabble of mercenaries, thugs, and combat droids, which means that she may be no longer with the Empire, and perhaps neither is Thrawn. We always knew that Thrawn's allegiance was to his own people first. His foray into the Galactic Empire Navy was a fact-finding mission to learn more about the wider galaxy and how it could affect his own people, the Chiss. Now, we know that Thrawn was carried away into the Unknown Region by those Purgles, and we also know that Thrawn's uh, people, the Chiss, also called the Unknown Region their home. So I think it's very likely that Thrawn made it back to his home, maybe got debriefed by an intel officer, and now he is kind of figuring out what his next move is now that the Empire has collapsed. Magistrate Elizabeth might just be one of the contacts he's trained, just like Eli Vanto, and now he's using individuals like her to keep him posted about the wider galaxy. Other recent clues about Thrawn's return are a bit more subtle, like this peaceful scene in which Baby Yoda catches a glimpse of a few Purgle or Space Whales flying alongside Mando Dad's ship in hyperspace. This is the first time we actually see these Purgle in live action. I don't think it's just a coincidence. I think it's just another teaser or sign that Thrawn is approaching very soon, and I think this will be a huge moment for Disney Star Wars, even bigger than the release of the sequel trilogy. And here's why. When the original trilogy ended, there was close to a two-decade gap in which no Star Wars films were made. This is sort of when the Star Wars EU flourished and you had all sorts of random people writing books, making video games, creating comics. It was chaotic, but it was really cool. And during that time period, Timothy Zahn created the Thrawn trilogy. These books sold so well that it's rumored that George Lucas took notice and saw this as a sign that there was actually a market for more Star Wars. For better or worse, without Thrawn, there would be no revitalization and interest in the Star Wars galaxy. There would be no prequels, 
no Clone Wars, and probably no sequels or any of the other stuff that you like or hate. And so I think seeing Thrawn appear in live action is a big deal. It could revitalize uh, Star Wars in a time when Disney is going through some pretty controversial times. Anyway guys, let me know in the comment section below what you think. Are you guys looking forward to the return of Thrawn? Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.